Hi, I'm Chris Spizak, and this is the Words You Should Know podcast. A few stolen minutes out of your day to talk words and communication, because our daily lives are surrounded by the evolution of and the influence of words. Forget the grammar police. There is so much more to this conversation. And as a reminder, a free download of fiction editing cheat sheets, family story writing references, and business communication tips are available on my website, getagripponyourgrammar.com. Welcome to episode number 40, where we'll discuss the origins of the phrase running amok, not only because we can all feel like chickens with our heads cut off at times, but also because this is another expression that has a false story floating around when it comes to etymology. And you know I'm out to address that. But first, here's the latest in word, language, and writing news. The news is hard to listen to sometimes. So today's stories are pulling from headlines I'm guessing you haven't been following. Why? Because there is so much to follow in the world. And while so much is difficult and confusing, and let's be real, sometimes a bit straight up horrific, sometimes news is simply fascinating. And those are stories worth paying attention to as well, right? We talk language news on this podcast, folks. And here's two language stories that maybe you need to know. I've recently come across the story of an Egyptian student's tablet of sorts. And when I say tablet, I don't mean anything digital. This was an ancient Egyptian educational tool, a board that was whitewashed again and again for students to practice their writing, not to waste papyrus, perhaps, as one might use a chalkboard, whiteboard, or computer so as not to waste paper today. Now, this writing board not only has the students' writing, but it also has an instructor's editing notes, maybe even grading notes, inserted around the writing in red ink. Seriously, teachers have loved their red pens for a long time. I had no idea, though I know pens is not accurate when we're talking about ancient Egypt. I'm still working on the writing technology of the day and what specific instrumentation was used with the red and black paints that are still readable today. Well, if one can read this type of writing, that is. Admittedly, this one isn't a recent news story. The Met Museum, who now has this gessoed board, notes its provenance as being purchased in 1928 from someone in Cairo, Egypt. And the object itself dates back to sometime just shy of 2,000 years BCE. Stumbling across writing education in history like this floors me and gives me such a greater perspective on our communication pursuits today. We have been trying to write well and communicate our ideas clearly and succinctly for a long time. Now, My next news story is related to this finding. A recent study published in the scientific journal Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience has shown that writing on paper preserves ideas in our brains more successfully than writing on keyboards, smartphones, or other electronic devices. Just a bunch of Luddites trying to make a statement, you say? Not so fast. These researchers in Japan were studying the effectiveness of our memories after note-taking. And after seeing their findings, they argue that using a pen and paper allows for greater spatial awareness in writing, which allows for better recall. Just think of the specifics here. When you take notes, you write down the ideas, but perhaps you then add in something on the sidebar. Then you underline something to emphasize it. Then you add in something with an arrow or a carrot, inserting new information into the previously recorded ideas. There's a lot of spatial awareness happening simply in that single page of notes, rather than on a screen that's usually filled up in order, with less jumping around, fewer complexities in font, sidebar notes, doodles, stars, insertions, and other all-over-the-place factors. You can imagine it, can't you? Now, is the activity in the hippocampus triggered by such scattered, or should I say layered, note-taking efforts, as opposed to what can be handled on our present-day screen? Does using tools like digital highlighters enhance our memory when utilizing digital note-taking methods? Will this change as technology and digital note-taking improves? What does your gut say? This research poses some fascinating questions that go far beyond matters of what we feel comfortable with and what we're used to. Further details in my show notes, of course. 
but I'd be fascinated to hear your reaction. But beyond ancient editors and brain research, there's so much more we need to cover today. Let's turn to today's English language history and trivia. If we want to talk fake news, there are so many stories we could tell. Heck, you could talk about a fake news, yes, totally untrue rumor that comes from the word news. Yes, a totally untrue rumor that the word news comes from N-E-W-S, as in information gathered from the North, East, West, and South, N-E-W-S. But that's not true. So when you come across that meme, I promise you, it's not one to believe. Please don't pass it on. Hey, there's our lesson and reminder for today. Don't just believe what you read on the internet. Research, validation, authentication is important. There are so many strange language rumors out there. We've talked about the rule of thumb before. For example, hello, wife abuse rumors? Just no. So I know you're with me on this. Today, let's chat about the phrase running amok. Here's your hint. It's not actually about a ship that is running aground into the muck. Running amok. No, that is not the story, so please stop believing it's the truth. Instead, running amok has a much darker history, one based in mental health and or a philosophy of warfare. My favorite comparison is perhaps the more modern expression to go postal. What does going postal mean? It means to go wild, to have a breakdown, to cause chaos. Its usage is fairly casual today, but its roots were much darker, based in real violence that broke out among disgruntled postal workers starting in roughly 1986 and through the 1990s, when other employees and sometimes the general public was killed because of these breakdown moments. Yes, guns were involved, and that's an entirely different conversation, which we will save for another time. Now, much like going postal, running amok has gone through the same transition from horrific to casual, now meaning simply to lose it, to go wild, to be chaotic to the nth degree. As with any phrase of unclear origin, people make many guesses about where it came from, because nautical references really do seem to pop up again and again in our everyday expressions, this is often where our guesses go. However, as I've said, running amok has nothing to do with steering a ship into the muck and getting it stuck in the muddy, sticky, shallow waters. Sure, you could argue that the navigators might have run amok, causing trouble instead of doing their jobs. But this isn't the story, folks. Instead, the first English usage of amok, that's A-M-O-K, is from the 1516 text, The Book of Duarte Barbosa an account of the countries bordering on the Indian Ocean and their inhabitants. But amok was most greatly popularized by Captain James Cook in 1772. And if I say Captain Cook, and you immediately jump to Peter Pan's Captain Hook, there may be fair reason, with some historians believing that the author J.M. Barry partially created his Captain Hook, inspired by the famed sea captain James Cook, who was killed by people of a land he didn't understand and who didn't understand him, perhaps much like the Lost Boys, who Captain Hook certainly didn't respect or understand. Interesting, but I'm getting away from my point. Shout out to Captain James Cook in popularizing this word in the English language, but a muck comes from a Malay word, and here's where we go dark, referring to either a psychiatric disorder where one falls into a murderous frenzy from drug usage, evil spirits in action, or other unknown circumstances, yikes, and or it's connected with a type of Malaysian and or Javanese warrior soldier called the Amoko, or Amako, who believed greatly in the glory of death in battle and earning favor from the gods in such a way, and thus without any fear of death, were frenzied on the battlefield and in attacks on the street when so driven. In this way, amok is not so different from the origin of the word berserk, coming from the Norse berserkers, warriors who attacked and killed with such a wild frenzy that they appeared to be in a trance when in action. As with many antiquated cross-cultural expressions, there is potential for judgment and disrespect hiding in the etymological weeds, or should I say the etymological muck. However, generally, the association with being crazed seems to be the only piece of this expression that carried into the English language. These days, we think of running amok as things getting out of hand. Preschoolers on the loose with finger paints on the walls, they're running amok, right? 
But really, when people use this expression, they actually have no idea how truly out of hand this word actually implies. Violence. Death. Warfare. Not where our brains go, right? A ship running into the muck? Yeah, that's not it at all. Is your mind now running amok with these ideas? Actually, scratch that. That is far too complicated a question and potentially too brutal. But aren't language origin stories fascinating? Now, turning to today's language challenge. At the beginning of this episode, before our conversation ran amok about the phrase amok, I mentioned inserting notes into a document by adding carrots, those little vertical arrows or upside-down Vs that editors and perhaps grammar teachers from ancient Egypt have been known to love. Heck, you could insert so many carrots into the explorations we've talked about today. Like extra notes on going postal and berserkers and false origin stories about mud. But think fast. How do you spell this word carrot? Is it the same as the vegetable? Of gold or diamonds? Is it something else entirely? How confident do you feel? The answers, as always, can be found on my website. Lastly, for my personal update, for those who have been following along with me on this podcast, you know I'm an author, but I'm also a fiction editor and sometimes a ghostwriter. What is a ghostwriter? Well, it doesn't mean I'm haunted. Well, I don't think so anyway. It means that I have been known to pen books for others who have a story, a mission, an idea, or something great to share, but who either don't have the time, the passion, or the know-how when it comes to actually making it happen. So I have a shelf in my home office where I proudly showcase my clients' books, fiction and nonfiction, editorial assistance, and ghostwriting. And this shelf has just expanded by three titles in the past few weeks. I just have to keep on sharing the writers and the storytellers making it happen. Everyone who has an idea to share that they can find a way to communicate with the world. How awesome is it to see those ideas, that dream, come to life? It's one thing when I experience this feeling for myself as an author, but when I have the privilege of celebrating with my clients, it makes me so incredibly happy. More on my own work soon. Today, I am just tossing up some punctuation-shaped confetti as I am cheering others on because, wow, celebrating others' successes is sometimes just as exciting as celebrating your own. Who's with me? And what are you working on? Now, I'm no Egyptian schoolmaster. My editorial commentary doesn't run amok across the page, though I do love to include lots of side notes and carrots, but I'll save the rest of my language notes for future episodes. Are you curious or confused about the words you use every day? For more information on language news, trivia, tips, and explorations, I invite you to sign up for my monthly newsletter at getagriponyourgrammar.com. That's also a great place for free downloads and to learn more about my books, Get a Grip on Your Grammar, the Novel Editing Workbook, and the Family Story Workbook. Thank you so much to those of you who have taken the time to review or rate this podcast. And if you haven't, why don't you head over to wherever you listen and do so? I am so grateful for it. And as always, I invite you to share your latest writing updates or insights or questions with me. I love hearing from you. Again, connect on getagriponyourgrammar.com. Until next time. Words. Language. Communication. We've got this.